Welcome to Partnering with Employers to Support Economic Advancement. This is Kyle Hartung, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Sarah Jenis. As we think about partnering with employers, there's two critical questions that uh, I feel like we wrestle with in the field. The first one has to do with this broader question around how do we really invite and actually nourish the participation of uh, more employers in our ecosystems that can enhance and, and support our ability to bring work-based learning to scale for students. But also how do we ensure that all stakeholders' needs are met, so folks on the education side as well as the employer side, to make sure that young people have meaningful work-based learning experiences once they enter the workplace. Um, you know, and so as we think through these questions, um, some of the things I'd like you to hold in the background are about, you know, what do we see as the biggest obstacles in, in our work to actually uh, partner differently and in more supportive ways with employers? What do we want employers to do? What would it look like if we had more employers in the room as we were designing and talking about designing these systems? And what would that actually mean? What would we want from employers? So we'd like to begin by exploring and going through a little bit um, about some ideas that uh, we think are really critical to consider as we think about the purposes and the promise of work-based learning. So at the core of, of thinking about uh, building a system for work-based learning is this idea of, of a really strong partnership and alignment with a local employer community and the ways that that, that partnership can actually advance the types of opportunities that we think are critical. And so as you consider this, this topic, you know, I ask you know, to think about like, what does this mean to you? And, and as we think about this idea of, of how we partner with employers and the critical way that we partner with them, that that's the thing that's going to allow us to build equitable pathways that actually lead to these high skill, high demand and family sustaining careers. And as critical partners, they really can and should be impacting design along all points in the pathway as we think about how they inform and can, can shape and support the design of, of curricular experiences from both academic and technical standpoints, the way that we think about what kind of courses young people have access to over time, as well as then how they're actually training and um, walking into being qualified to, to, to um, find meaningful employment. And really critical as we think about the idea of building these partnerships is that intermediaries and intermediary functions play a really critical role in how this work plays out. Now, these things are not true at scale. Uh, in, in many regards, these are, this is still a, a real aspiration when we think about not, not things happening at a local level. There, there's lots of great examples of, of this happening. But what is, if we want these to be true at scale, what really needs to happen? And there's many reasons that this is a, a really critical conversation point uh, right now. Um, but one lens in particular has to do as we think about uh, in-school youth and pathways for in-school youth. And when we look at the teen employment data, um, you know, we're seeing historic and record lows um, since I think we've been actually collecting data about youth employment. Um, and so, you know, even as recently as 2018, you know, only about one third of, of uh, 16 to 19 year olds were employed. And so one of the, one of the great value adds of work-based learning, aside from developing content and, and skills and knowledge, is that it really solves for some of this challenge that you know, we kind of have um, you know, a situation where it's really hard to get a job unless you have experience, but it's really hard to get experience unless you can have a job. And so work-based learning creates an intersection point that allows and opens different types of access for young people in the working world. And so it also then begs questions about what are our actual expectations about teens in the workplace. Um, so there's lots of ways that we, we're not going to dive deeply into how we actually build work-based learning. But from, from our point of view, we kind of see some of these things as, as the North Star of work-based learning. That, you know, how do we use work-based learning to support entry and advancement into not just a first job, but a career trajectory for young people. How do we make sure that work-based learning is designed such that it provides meaningful tasks and opportunities to build the types of skills and knowledge that will um, welcome people into careers over time? Really critical is at the, the higher ends of work-based learning experiences, how do we make sure that we're offering compensation um, and that, that, that students are employees for some part of their time as a part of a company or an organization? Um, as we design this, like how do we make sure that we're, we're being um, intentional about how we reward the way um, skills are developed? Um, are we clear about what skills need to be um, focused on? And that ultimately, if we do this right, 
um, we can support students all along the pipeline as they move through their post-secondary experiences and persist through uh, attainment of their first credentials and degrees um, uh, and be, be really prepared to continue to move forward in their professional lives. Now, the critical piece around this is also one having to do with, with partnerships. And as we think about this bigger question about why does work-based learning matter? Well, we can't, this isn't a, a one-sided equation that employers and educators really need each other uh, and they need to be in conversation with each other as we talk about um, attaining different goals in the labor market and actually changing the outcomes of regional economies. Um, and so that together and only through partnership and collaboration can we actually leverage um, the, the type of knowledge and skills that both sides of the house, so to speak, uh, can bring together to really advance a big, bold vision for young people over time. Um, so what are some of the core purposes of work-based learning for participants? Um, I, I know much of this network is really familiar with these, but yeah, this provides a really clear exposure to the world of work. Um, what is working life? What does that mean? Um, who am I in the working world? Um, obviously, then it provides deeper exposure into particular career fields and what are the needs and values um, within those industries? What do I need to know and understand and be able to do if I want to pursue a career in those? You know, uh, research and practice uh, continually reveals that there's a relationship between uh, the strengthening of academic learning as it is uh, um, conducted in parallel with, with learning that occurs in, the, occurs in the workplace and students being able to see how what they're learning in an educational context can be applied in a work-based one. Um, obviously, there's the critical um, aspect of developing these professional skills that are very hard to get um, in, in a classroom context. And that in its ideal form, it is really leading to um, a, a temporary or permanent job over time for young people um, and ultimately act, offering them access to different types of capital that are really important as they continue to grow and mature. Um, obviously, if we only focus on the, the, the participant side, we'd be remiss. And so it's really important to focus, and as we think about partnering with employers, to really highlight and discuss the purposes of work-based learning from their perspective as well. And so, you know, as we have these conversations, we, we're thinking about how do we help employers see and lean into the fact that work-based learning is one of the many ways that they can help to develop uh, a talent pipeline um, as they think about you know, sort of a grow your own strategy and that really thinking about um, higher forms of, of work-based learning as, as part of how they can welcome new and in particularly diverse and innovative, uh, diverse um, uh, participants, but also the new and innovative ideas from the younger generation into their organizations and company and ultimately their broader industry. Um, you know, as we think about diversity and equity and inclusion in the workplace, um, you know, work-based learning is one of the many ways that, that um, business and industry and organizations can actually really lean into that as a, as a clear way to, to open up uh, and diversify their workforce. Um, you know, uh, if we're being honest, you know, I think that uh, name recognition is, an, is important to organizations. And I think that, you know, being uh, seen in the public realm as, as uh, someone who is welcoming young people into the workplace and investing in the next generation of young people in our country is uh, of, of incredible value. And that ultimately um, it's a way to sort of give back and also strengthen their, their economies, um, address issues around unemployment, um, you know, bringing people and attracting actually new business um, and adjacent industries to their work. So value all around. The other uh, thing just to mention very briefly, and we won't uh, linger here for too long here today, is a couple more points in that many of the skills that employers continually are signaling across industries that are, that are critical and in demand in their work are the ones sort of identified here on the, on the right-hand side of your screen. And different reports will highlight different numbers um, and you know, things will move around from year to year as, as new surveys are conducted. But the critical takeaway here is that as you look at this list, many of these skills are not effectively taught in, in educational contexts. Um, they can be introduced, um, they can be talked about, they can be leveraged in academic settings, but ultimately problem solving in the workplace is very different than problem solving in a classroom. Um, engaging in teamwork um, on a manufacturing floor is very different than engaging in teamwork on a um, history assignment in a class. It's a valuable way to introduce the ideas of teamwork and problem solving and uh, leadership, for instance, but they really need to be deployed and applied in a work-based context. And so when we bring all this together, um, what we kind of see is this sort of what, what I would call the promise of work-based learning. And so it sort of is, is the central function as we, as we triangulate across academic, technical, and employability skills. 
And often the design of work-based learning, and rightfully so, focuses on skills and knowledge. But if we open up the aperture on this and think more intentionally on the educator and the employer side about how also that work-based learning can welcome young people into developing a clear identity and a value set and an understanding of the epistemology of a particular discipline. And so these things together sort of create the grammar of a particular industry or occupation and that it's really hard to, to understand how to speak those languages unless you have clear and articulated experience in the workplace. Um, a couple of, of final points here before I, I transition over to, to Sarah is um, it's not enough for us to just ask young people to go into the workplace um, and work. Um, I think that there's an intentionality and in what we know about how people learn, whether um, how young people learn or adults learn, is that the, the critical need for this work to be intentional, um, for it to be systematic, for it to be organized, um, what's not going to be helpful is to enter a workplace um, and have an, an unstructured experience that you know does not um, ask people to be uh, deeply engaged in meaningful work, but also to be reflective about what that work means to them, what they're learning from it, and how they're going to apply it to the next set of experiences. And so this goes back to this really critical idea of the partnership. And as I as you look at this statement, you know I wonder, you know, what do you notice about it? Uh, what feels real versus what would you like to fix? Uh, what role does the employer play in organizing work in general, and how can educators and employers partner and partner differently to make sure that these things are valuable for young people? So um, a couple of, of, of high-level points here is, is, again, just to really double down on this, this, this symbiotic relationship as we think about work-based learning in terms of why engage employers. So employers need schools and training providers, schools need employers as they, they're, they're really um, thinking about how to, they help young people get the skills and knowledge and competencies that they need. Employers need the schools and training providers and ultimately the, the communities to actually support and wrap supports around students and their families um, to make sure that they can, can um, stand on solid ground. Um, and then of course, the sort of the educational providers need the employers to employ their graduates um, and continue to support their graduates over time. And so how do we build um, local and regional focal points about you know building talent from from within our communities, um, and I think it's through this this partnership um, and, and the lens of partnership that we can really uh, do this work at, at better scale. And so, uh, with those thoughts, what I would like to do is actually um, pass the uh, um, pass the ball, so to speak, to my colleague uh, Sarah. I welcome her into this conversation to talk um, and walk us through. Uh, the ways that we think that you can address and, and we hope to ask, sort of outline and address some of the questions, concerns, and ultimately misconceptions that we see in the field that can actually get in the way of us being able to um, scale work-based learning and work differently with employers. So Sarah, um, come on in. Yes, thank you, Kyle. This is Sarah speaking. So in thinking about how to execute a vision of work-based learning, we wanted to talk through some of the common questions, misconceptions, and challenges we hear from the field around what high-quality work-based learning looks like, how to prepare both young people and employers for work-based learning opportunities, and how cross-sector partners can come together to integrate the world of work with the world of learning for young people. One helpful framework to keep in mind when considering these questions is the seven principles of work-based learning that Kyle discussed earlier. These principles can guide stakeholders in developing and assessing high-quality work-based learning experiences. The questions on this slide are complex, but they are the right ones to be asking. I'll be responding to some of these questions directly, particularly the ones about high-quality experiences and preparation for employers. So in addition to the questions on the previous slide, we also hear about concerns employers may have about offering work-based learning through their company. This particular list was developed through the Texas Education Agency's statewide listening tour, where they asked employers about what barriers or concerns they had with work-based learning. But this list is representative with what we hear from the um, stakeholders nationwide. Today, we'll be primarily talking about the top three concerns and how to address them. So that includes student readiness and maturity, insurance and liability, and time commitment. 
So in thinking about readiness and maturity, it's important to consider what it means to be ready to work at a particular organization. What skills does that require? Once we define readiness and maturity, we can create structures to ensure that students have the necessary foundational skills to succeed in a workplace. What happens before, during, and after the work-based learning experience is also crucial. For example, if you're preparing a student for an internship, one piece of preparation might involve a mock job interview. Another piece of preparation before the experience is to be clear about the technical and employability skills that a young person is expected to have when they walk in on day one. It's important to have these conversations with employers ahead of time so that everyone's expectations are aligned. During and after a work-based learning experience, we want to make sure that young people have opportunities to reflect on what they did, what skills they are developing, and share thoughts with their school staff member and their supervisor about what's going on throughout their work-based learning experience. And as the experience is occurring, there should also be a communication across stakeholders and with the work-based learning participant about how the young person is doing, what's going well, what supports are needed. This communication can be supported through resources like the Massachusetts Work-Based Learning Plan shown to the right of this slide. The plan asks for supervisors to review their employee skills such as initiative, communication, and critical thinking and exclude, include space for comments, which opens the door for young people to hear both uh, positive and constructive feedback about their performance in the workplace. In linking the readiness and maturity factor back to the principles of work-based learning, it's important to remember that young people will often rise to the expectations we set, which means that we wanna set high expectations, but also create the supports that are necessary for success. We want young people to participate in real, meaningful work through work-based learning, which will help them develop an identity as a professional and learn about the world of work broadly. It's important to remember that students are building both technical and employability skills through work-based learning. So it's important to get a sense of what the employer's top employability skills are um, and, and essentially think about how young people can develop these skills. If an employer really cares about something like creativity, preparation for that and developing that ability is going to look a lot differently than preparation for working collaboratively. So that's just something to think through and prioritize. How do we learn these skills? How do we further develop them in a workplace? Mentoring, supervision, and feedback are all impo are important to all employees, but particularly important for young people. You don't know what you don't know, and for many young people, there will be lots of questions and new information acquired through their work-based learning experience. In considering the workplace environment, it's important to consider diversity, equity, and inclusion implications and recognize that a rising tide lifts all boats. By creating a welcoming environment to young people, you're also likely assisting all employees by doing things like allowing space for questions and giving just-in-time feedback, which all employees benefit from. Insurance and liability is another big concern employers have when it comes to working with young people. But generally speaking, liability laws apply equally to youth and adults. For example, if your company offers workers compensation for adult workers, this would also apply to youth workers. We also don't see that age restrictions are usually prohibitive, especially for older high school students. For example, 16 and 17 year olds are able to work unlimited hours. There are some more restrictions for 14 and 15 year olds, but they still aren't prohibitive. For those who are really concerned about liability, we have seen some stakeholders are alleviated or that concern is alleviated for some stakeholders when additional insurance is purchased either by the employer or the school. And at the bottom of the slide, I've linked uh, the resource youth rules because it's a helpful Department of Labor resource. Uh, for both teens and parents that clearly outlines different age restrictions around work. Federal laws pertaining to youth employment generally fall under the U.S. Department of Labor and Wage, uh, excuse me, Labor, Wage and Hour Division, which enforces the, Fe the Fair Labor Standards Act, or FLSA. FLSA outlines federally mandated provisions related to wages and overtime pay, hours worked, record keeping, and child labor, and in particular for us, FLSA outlines hazardous occupations that you have to be at least 18 years old to perform, listed on the left-hand side of the slide. 
These include tasks like manufacturing and storing explosives and exposure to radioactive substances. As you might guess, in many, many jobs and many, many tasks will not involve these hazardous occupations, which means that there's a lot of work-based learning opportunities available to students that aren't in violation of this list. Most employers that work with young people identify only one of these occupations, which is operating a forklift, as an activity in which their workforce regularly engages. So that's something to be aware of. Those under the age of 18 cannot operate a forklift. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration is under the Department of Labor and it sets the regu regulations and enforces workplace safety standards. Again, like with most liability things, um, youth and adult workers are treated similarly in that employers are required to pro provide both youth and adults with the appropriate and necessary safety training information. One resource that, that, that we've heard from our partners in the field that can be helpful is this Career Safe website which offers online training, such as the OSHA 10-hour general industry training certification. Time commitment is another concern cited by all stakeholders. As we build out pathways and work-based learning experiences, one thing to keep in mind is that we are changing systems and to consider how this work changes the way we do things altogether, rather than simply adding another responsibility to our plate. At the same time, work-based learning does uh, have an intensive time commitment, and we don't want to be dismissive of that. So what are the things that we can do to support work-based learning in the time that it does take? Building staff capacity is essential to supporting work-based learning. Um, it's really helpful if you can have a position like a work-based learning coordinator to lead and drive work-based learning. But in addition to dedicated staff capacity, it's important to think about how work-based learning can impact other staff such as teachers, school counselors, HR personnel, and work-based learning supervisors. One way to build a sustainable, well-designed work-based learning continuum is to build out regularly scheduled opportunities that consider both the academic and industry calendars. Once some events, for instance, a worksite tour, become regular and well-run, adding additional activities can uh, boost out your work-based learning continuum and create more opportunities for students to participate in. One of the biggest time commitments of work-based learning is supporting young people through the experience. So it's really important for, communi uh, for communication to occur across stakeholders about who exactly is responsible for what. There are some smaller details that happen, like who is, or who is responsible for hosting mock interviews, who is responsible for supporting young people through their hiring paperwork. Once those are assigned and figures out, figured out, the process will run a lot smoother. Um, as I mentioned, time commitment is something that all stakeholders are considering, but creating resources like this one, this industry menu, um, can be very helpful to employers. Basically, it outlines the activity and time commitments, which is especially helpful when you're establishing a relationship with an employer, because it allows them to engage at the level they feel comfortable, but give them an idea of how the relationship can grow. So maybe they would start with something small, like a guest speaker, and work their way up to an internship. And that's what we always recommend. It's okay to start small. If you don't have any work-based learning activities, then adding one in next year is improvement. So just uh, continually adding both to the number of activities and the number of students participating. This is another example of a resource that can help employers determine where they want to engage with work-based learning. What I like about this document is that it shows the range of work-based learning experiences um, on, the, on the left side from awareness to training, and it also demonstrates a range of time commitments. So the top column shows uh, supporting, starting on the left, which is an hour long, or hours long commitment to championing, championing, which is months long. In the top left corner, we see that a workplace tour activity is an awareness activity that takes about two hours. So that's an example of a, of a smaller time commitment. And then if we look at the bottom right corner, we see that a youth apprenticeship is a career training opportunity that can take upwards of 450 hours. So again, it shows employers a variety of ways that they can engage in what the time commitment looks like. One thing to remember when considering the time commitment is that employers are developing a talent pipeline through work-based learning, which can save time further down the road. Recruitment and retention processes tend to be reactive, and work-based learning is a proactive approach. 
only 41% of companies offer opportunities like internships and apprenticeships, and that number actually falls to 29% for small companies. The estimated cost of turnover is about 20% of an entry level employee's, excuse me, of an entry level employee's annual salary. Working with young people creates the opportunity to develop talent and develop a proactive approach to recruitment and retention. So now that we've worked through some of the challenges of work-based learning, I wanted to briefly share some of the benefits that we've heard from the field and some examples of return on investment. So Johns Hopkins Hospital was, about, uh, was able to reduce turnover and hiring costs by developing a training program to fill non-medical positions. And they estimated that their ROI over a one-year period was 74%. CVS Caremarks invested $2.9 million in government program and workforce initiative efforts and received $5.3 million in tax credits. And they calculated that their return relative to cost was 179%, which is huge. State Street, which is a financial holding company, hires about 100 interns per year, and 70% of them end up being full-time employees, which is a super high conversion rate. Um, and their, their VP speaks to how these interns are already well-trained and they're very accountable when they become full-time employees. Um, Carroll County is a great example of a regional approach to work-based learning through a supportive Chamber of Commerce intermediary engaged employers and passionate educators. So we see at Sugar Foods Corporation, which is a multinational foods products company, young people participate in a variety of factory fun functions ranging from manufacturing to research and development to food production. So again, they're getting that real experience in a variety of ways through, through this corporation. And then Southwire is a leading manufacturer of electrical cable and wiring. Earlier, I talked about the importance of giving students real work, meaningful work, and one, this, this is an example of how well that paid off for Southwire. So Southwire, again, manufactures electrical cable and wiring, and they gave students the opportunity to try to solve a problem um, about figuring out the remaining spool left on, or excuse me, the remaining wire left on a spool. Students to solve this problem were really innovative, and they created an app that determined the remaining wire left and that has saved the company $750,000, which is a huge return on investment. So I will pass things back to Kyle for now, and he's gonna go ahead and wrap us up. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, this level of, of detail and insight and information, I think is uh, really helpful. Um, and you know, please, of course, follow up with us, uh, reach out directly to, to Sarah um, or myself or others on, on the JFF team if you have uh, follow-up questions about some of these organizations, uh, some of these examples, or um, for access to additional tools and resources around these. Um, so really to kind of bring, bring us out here, um, just a, a couple of, of final points as we think about this, this idea of nourishment and invitation to employers to participate, um, and a couple of key reminders, especially um, as folks from the education side working to tackle these challenges. Um, just remembering that, that, you know, as we start to, to welcome employers into this conversation, you know, as Sarah was, was wrapping up uh, a moment ago, you know, they need to know that, that their support and investment in this will not be a loss leader for them. And really helping them to understand and see the value add of welcoming young people into the workplace on all dimensions of, of workplace learning. Um, they need to feel confident that young people um, will be productive and will be able to enter the workplace ready for that. Um, and I think that there's some even uh, additional myths that need to be to dismissed and, and diminished there as well. But that only comes through partnering uh, between education and employers to have real conversations about the needs of young people and creating uh, welcoming environments for young people in the workplace. Um, and ultimately, you know, how do employers feel confident in the education and wraparound supports that uh, students have access to, that they're going to be supported throughout their training, and then it does not become uh, the sole responsibility of the employer to take care of and make sure that um, the students have the supports they need to be successful in that work and endeavors. So uh, we thank you very much for uh, joining in uh, and listening into this, this conversation. Um, uh, a lot more to unpack here, uh, both from a technical standpoint, but also from a conceptual standpoint. But we uh, hope that you uh, uh, are interested in, in learning more. And again, we welcome additional conversation and insights. And um, as a, a number of parting questions, 
we would like to just welcome a conversation around some of these really big ideas and to hear more and learn more from you about um, bright spots in your own efforts around employer engagement and cultivation. Uh, and let's get some dialogue going across the network uh, about how, what are the success, successful moments that you can highlight that people can maybe learn from and consider and think more deeply about how they might replicate some approach in their own context. But also, let's also be clear and transparent about what are the things that we struggle with so that we might be able to uh, remediate or mitigate some of those challenges. Um, and that ultimately, like, what are some things that you're thinking or wondering about um, as a result of, of this conversation today that you weren't thinking or wondering about last week or, or last month? Um, so this is just a starting place for conversation, uh, and we look forward to continuing it. Thank you so much.